risotto sort of with raisins, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later. Um, so first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we're going to talk about today, which are the food traditions associated with Hanukkah. Then we're going to talk about a few non-traditional ways that you might consider celebrating. And finally, talk about um, five specific recipes that I've chosen. Um, I hope you'll join in. Please, uh, those of you who are Sephardic, you can correct my pronunciation of Sephardic uh, dishes because uh, I'm Ashkenazic and I don't know, a lot of these uh, names are not familiar to me, but I enjoyed reading about them and making a few of them. So, but before we get started on the food, I just wanted to give you a couple of bits of Hanukkah trivia because I found these in my research and they were so fascinating to me. First of all, the dreidel game. Everybody loves playing dreidel, right? Well, I had no idea that it actually came from a Christmas ritual, uh, which is a German game that's uh, taken from a British game, which is called teetotum. And I'm gonna have to ask my British friends about that, but um, it's a top, it's a game in Britain played with the top. And of course that went to Germany and then to our, our, finally, our dreidel game. And the gelt tradition. Well, gelt didn't start with Hanukkah gelt. <laughs> Apparently it started um, in the 18th century and um, it was an Eastern European tradition of giving tips. It was giving tips to itinerant workers and then it was even giving tips to uh, teachers. And the kids would give the tips to the teachers. It was only later that it turned around and ended up being the adults giving the kids the gelt. Um, how did the chocolate gelt start? Well, there are two stories. One is the URJ, I'm a reformed Jew and the Union for Reform Judaism said it started when the Jews were very active in the chocolate making uh, manufacturing business in the late 19th century. There is another story, which is that the Loft Company of New York, I think, um, created uh, chocolate coins in the 1920s and they started using them uh, and they became Hanukkah gelt. Finally, I just wanna tell you one little tradition that is somewhat food related, which is a French wine tradition. In the Avignon region of France, um, it's customary on the Shabbat during Hanukkah to open a new cask of wine, a new bottle or a new cask. Um, so tonight in our house, I'm sure we'll be opening a bottle of wine and I expect maybe you will too. Anyway, on to the food. Um, of course, all of us uh, or those of us who are Ashkenazic know about latkes. And as far as I can tell, I did not find a fried food um, of an Ashkenazic tradition that was sweet. We're kind of all about the savory. Um, and we all know the, the story of the Maccabees and why the, the eight nights of oil, the miracle of the oil coming at the end of uh, lasting for eight nights. But it turns out that there's a couple of other reasons why oil is important. And it turns out that um, the Hebrew word for oil, um, contains the same letters as the number of days, uh, Shmona, that the oil lasted, which I found interesting. I didn't know that. There's another tradition in um, Hanukkah food, which uh, is lesser known than the oil tradition, which is dairy. And that comes from the story of Judah. Um, many of us uh, are more aware of the Maccabees than of Judith, but Judith apparently, Judith was a young woman who lived in Judea at the time of uh, the Greek occupation. And she was able to uh, cause a Greek general to fall asleep by feeding him a lot of cheese. Well, we all, uh, those of us in the food world know that cheese has a sort of soporific effect. And she caused this general to fall asleep. Um, on finding that their general had fallen asleep uh, and once he was asleep, she, she killed him. The troop, the Greek troops after the killing were uh, so upset that they ran away. And um, in memory of her bravery, we, tend, we eat foods that have dairy in them. 
Um, so I want to start with, of course, the Ashkenazic fried food, and that's latkes. Um, but there are a lot of Sephardic fried foods. Um, are any of you in the group? I, I can't see everybody, but is anybody Sephardic? Uh, know about the Sephardic traditions? It turns out that there are loads and loads of Sephardic fried foods that are traditional for Hanukkah. Now, some of them are sweet, and I'm gonna start with those sweet ones, but they're also savory ones, so stay tuned. Um, the sweet ones begin with, I'll give you a sort of, not a list of them, but I'll talk a little bit about them. There's one from Iran, which is called bamiya, which is a uh, fried dough. And fried dough is very popular in, um, in the Sephardic tradition when it's drenched in a sweet syrup. Often the syrup is made with honey or sugar and water, which if it's made with sugar and water, they, uh, you have to dissolve the sugar. But obviously if it's honey, it's already kind of uh, viscous. And then they use rose water or cardamom, uh, many of the Sephardic spices. So bamiya is uh, the Iranian version. Um, there are other versions that are irregularly shaped that are called bunuelos or bimuelos. Um, and those in fact, which began in Spain, morphed into what are the Mexican version, sopapillas. Many of us have eaten in restaurant. Mexican restaurants, you think of a sopapilla? Well, the conversos brought those um, to Mexico and they called, they obviously were, um, could also be a tradition for Hanukkah. Um, in Algeria and Tunisia, they're called debla. And in Turkey, they're called lakma. Well, there's another tradition which is um, in Morocco, which is more like what the Israelis do, which is sufganyot, and these are deep fried donuts. But the ones in Morocco are much easier to make because they're irregularly shaped typically. Um, and they're made with, often with the juice or the zest of an orange. And they were done at the, you know, in the winter time, they would get uh, zafa, they would get yaffa oranges, jaffa or yaffa oranges. And those are um, very delicious and they would use them to make the syrup that they would put on the donut. These donuts are crispier on the outside and they're a little airier on the inside than the donuts that we're used to. Um, they're also eaten in other countries besides Morocco. Um, sometimes they're eaten not, not during Passover but just on a regular day for breakfast without a sweet sauce on top, without a sweet uh, covering. The word S-F-E-N-J, which is svenj, I guess it's pronounced. Um, anyway, it comes from the, the Arabic word meaning sponge. And these are, you know, at light, they have lots of air holes in them. And the relatively neutral dough uh, works very well with a syrup that's poured on top. And it works also very well with tea which is a, a typical um, Sephardic beverage. Um, some people compare these to uh, the Italian version, which is called Zeppelis, and the French, which are beignets. Um, and then of course there are soufganyot, which are the Israeli version and are what we call jelly donuts, I guess. Um, they're yeasted. And I found some interesting stories about sufganyot because it turns out that um, it was a rather deliberate move on the part of the Israeli labor force, uh, labor um, movement to bring sufganyot to Israel as the uh, national, traditional national Hanukkah dish. Why? Well, it turns out that um, is <laughs> More Israelis eat sufganyot on, on Hanukkah than fast on Yom Kippur, which I, I guess you can understand that. But in any event, Histadrut made sure that sufganyot uh, were out marketing the uh, svenj. Why? Because they need to be made by professionals. It's not so easy to make a jelly donut. It's much easier to make a svenj, which is just light dough that you throw into a deep fat fryer. Uh, on the other hand, a jelly donut, well, it takes a little more uh, professionalism. And they wanted to keep the 
they wanted the uh, those who were the professional bakers to have jobs. And so Sufganiyot became the uh, national dish, shall we say, of Israel at Hanukkah time. Um, it's also true that they've, there's kind of a competition in Israel these days for Sufganiyot. Uh, it turns out that there are Israeli bakers who make them with very incredible fillings. Uh, one of the fillings I read about was uh, one that included a creme patissiere with champagne in it, which is uh, you know, kind of amazing. There are tours, there are Suf Sufganiyot tours, of course not now, but in non-COVID times there are tours of the various bakeries and their incredible Sufganiyot. Um, and there is another version of um, a sweet, a sweet kind of dough, which is in called Zalabia or Zalbia. And it's made um, yeasted dough like a Sufganiyot, but it's not, uh, it's much rounder and it's not filled. Um, they're sort of identical to an Indian version, which is called Jalabi. So as you can see, there's lots of different versions of something which is basically dough in a deep fryer with lots of sugar on top. Um, now, what about the savory treats? Well, there's lots of them too. And uh, I would start with the fried eggplant. Fried eggplant and honey, is that a nice combination? It's kind of sweet, savory, but mostly savory. And there's something in Tunisia, which is called brick. And it's a savory filling, which is usually an egg, kind of in an omelet form, uh, surrounded by phyllo dough and then deep fried. And um, then there are the, the dishes that are kind of a little bit, they're in between um, the deep fried and the dairy. And that's in, if you've gone to a Greek restaurant, you've had halloumi cheese, halloumi cheese deep fried. Imagine that. Usually you see it on uh, a Greek menu where it's uh, kind of been, it, it's, uh, I'm trying to think of how they do it. They, it's, it's actually flamed. But this, in the, in the Hanukkah tradition, it's deep fried. There are also in Syria, there's something which I found very fascinating. It's a pumpkin pancake. And it, they use bulgur wheat, mashed up pumpkin and spices. It has no eggs in it. So it's a, a rather a vegan delight. My son is vegan, so I'm always looking out for good vegan res recipes. There are also leek fritters in a lot of countries. You know, um, the typical Ashkenazic latke is made with onions. Well, in the Sephardic tradition, leeks are very common. And they are called keftes de prasa in a lot of countries. And in some places, they're actually called eje, which is, uh, I don't know if you know the, uh, food, the Jewish foodie whose name is Pupa Dweck. And she talks about how the, uh, Syrian Jews in Aleppo used to make leek fritters with all spices and Aleppo pepper. Aleppo pepper is, it's hot and spicy, but it's also kind of fruity. It's a really a remarkable spice. And um, some people say it tastes like a cross between cayenne pepper, paprika, and sort of a slightly fruity aftertaste. Well, um, there's also a Syrian version of a potato pancake, but unlike the um, Ashkenazic version, which is made with raw potatoes, um, it includes allspice and Aleppo pepper, and it's eaten inside a, pita, a piece of pita bread. And there are various, various other condiments you can put in it. Um, some people put in uh, pickled vegetables. Um, some people put in tomatoes, cucumbers, uh, pickled cabbage, uh, cauliflower. So um, the version that's done in Iran and Iraq of uh, potato pancakes uses cooked, cooked potatoes, not raw. And those are made in typically, it's a single pancake. It's made with a lot more egg and it's in a very large round, kind of if you know what a rosti is or roasty which is a German or a, 
uh, European version, and then it's cut into individual slices. And um, that sounds quite delicious to me. And it's also, uh, it's a, a version that's, that uses, you know, you could use leftover potatoes. Um, chickpeas are very common, are very commonly used in Iraq and they're made into turnovers, which are a Hanukkah dish called sambusek. I want to turn to the Italians for a moment because I was fascinated to realize that Italians have very different uh, traditions than either the Ashkenazic from Eastern Europe or the Sephardic from uh, the Mediterranean. There are many people who think that Italian Jews are neither Ashkenazic nor Sephardic. Um, they do a deep, deep fried rice ball, which is, uh, if you know Arancini, well, these are called Fratella di Rosso di Hanukkah, per Hanukkah, excuse me. And they include raisins and uh, pine nuts. Then they have a sweet fritter, which they call Fratel de Hanukkah. Well, it's kind of obvious what that would be. And they have sweet fried dough balls, which are not rice, but are in fact flour based. And they're called Przybski. And they have, their savories tend to be fried eggplant and fried chicken. The fried eggplant can be interestingly uh, put into what I don't think of as a typically Hanukkah dish, which is um, they use it in caponata, which they have for, as a Hanukkah dish. In South America, they use plantains. They have fried plantains and they're called patacones. They're uh, the Jews of Colombia and Cuba like them and they're savory typically, although you can make um, plantains sweet but they're typically savory. In Mexico, the dairy is, is savory and it's cheese croquettes. So we've talked a little bit about India because they have those uh, fried dough balls that are similar to the ones in the Sephardic community, but they also have something which they call gulab jamun, which is um, a milk-based pastry that's fried and then it's dunked in a sugar syrup and um, it's flavored with cardamom and saffron, which um, you know is is a, a typical Sephardic uh, and Indian spice, not not something that Ashkenazic Jews use. They also the Jews of Cochin of southern India you have a deep fried fritter, sweet fritter called neyapam. Um, they had they use South Indian ingredients, not surprisingly. Um, they also make um, coconut, dried fruit, nuts, and spice. They put coconut, dried fruit, nuts, and spices into their fritters. Well, those are things that are found in India. Um, then there are some deep fried things that are neither sweet nor savory. Those of you who remember the uh, dishing the diaspora, maybe you remember the uh, mala, malawa that we made. Well, the flaky, Yemeni bread, that's delicious, but it can be either sweet or savory or neither. And that of course is, um, it can be topped with eggs. It can be topped with hummus. It can be topped with something that uh, is in Michael Solomonov's, if you know Michael Solomonov's book, Zahav, he talks about zug, Z-H-U-G, zug. And um, that's a, apparently a very common topping from Malawa. Um, what do Ashkenazi Jews do that's sweet at Passover? Um, I'm sorry, at Hanukkah. Well, there's dairy. There are blintzes, there's rugula, there's cheesecake, and there's noodle kugel. And those are all, of course, things that are very dairy heavy. And um, there's also, it turns out, there's a savory version, which is from Romania, where part of my family is from. I've never had this before, but it's a fried or boiled cheese dumpling, and it's called a papanash. Well, there are also dairy pancakes on the Sephardic side. And some of them are, there's a Syrian one that's stuffed. That's very, um, it's filled with ricotta cheese. It's turned into a half moon and then it's deep fried. <laughs> 
and it's soaked in a, a syrup made from sugar, lemon, and rose or orange blossom water. That's a favorite of the uh, Jews who came from Aleppo. Um, they dip a quarter, one of, one of the ways that they make this, at, particularly at Hanukkah time, is to dip a corner of it after it's been done into the um, syrup, they dip it into pistachios, which is you know quite lovely. And then there is the boyakos, a very savory cheese biscuit, very light. Uh, it's not sweet. It's from Bulgaria, Turkey. Um, and in fact, the name of it, it's a Ladino name, which is uh, from the word boyos, which means buns. And these are little buns. <laughs> My husband and I ate quite a few of these last night. Um, Indians, apparently, Indian Jews make something they call barfi or bufi, which is a sweet made with condensed milk, sugar, and nuts. And they make it into something which is kind of like a fudge. And that's, of course, a dairy. Um, the Italians do a ricotta cheesecake. Not surprisingly, uh, it's quite delicious. So what can you do to update? Um, the usual, the, the typical recipes. Well, one of the things you can do is you can make latkes with lots of different vegetables. Um, you can use sweet potatoes, you can use leeks, you can use carrots, you can even use beets, raw beets. I made leeks, I made uh, latkes this year, grating up uh, raw beets and um, putting them in with potato and it's quite delicious. You can also use chickpea flour, you can use parsley, mint, uh, and turn it into something which is called eje, which is um, a Sephardic pancake and doesn't use any potato at all. There are different preparations. I don't know if any of you have seen uh, today's New York Times. The food section has something from Joe Nathan, which is called a potato latke. She, she calls it a genius method for making potato latkes. Well, it's made with a potato that is um, baked for a short while. So it's not quite finished and then it's grated. And then she puts it in the refrigerator after forming it into pancakes. Um, the part of this that I didn't really get was there's no onion. I get the no egg, but the no onion part, mm. I looked at the comments, you know, usually I don't read the comments on any of the uh, newspaper articles because they go wild, but the first 10 comments all said the same thing I said, which is, where's the onion? You can also put on new toppings. Um, I'm a particular fan of cranberry applesauce. You can use um, smoked salmon or creme fraiche as uh, Joe Nathan does. I think creme fraiche is really just a fancy name for sour cream, but you know, whatever. Um, there's also a version on a website of a, a group that does catering in New York of latkes that are fried instead of in oil, um, they're fried in duck fat. <laughs> it's not very healthy, but it sounds delicious. So I wanted to uh, tell you what, kind of give you a, a little sense of what are to me, the kind of totally crazy latkes. The winner of the new to me latke contest this year is taro latkes. Have you ever seen taro in the store? It's a very hard uh, vegetable that can be grated up, but it's taro latkes with sriracha lime cream sauce. And that comes from a website called Brit. And then there are um, ways that you can make latkes that are a little different from the norm. Um, you know, the typical latke is made with uh, deep frying it at the, and then serving it right away. Well, I've discovered that you can fry latkes and then freeze them. And then to reheat them, all you have to do is to take the latkes and put them into a preheated pan in a very high oven for a couple of minutes and they just crisp right up again. Um, you might want to pat off some of the oil that comes off of it, but basically it's a very quick way to do uh, a latke party for two or a bigger crowd um, without having to fry at the last minute. 
And any of you who know about frying latkes know that if you fry them, you're gonna see them, you're gonna smell the latkes for at least a day. <laughs> um, and then of course there are foods that are made with oil but are not fried and that's typically cookies or cakes. Um, and you can bake latkes. Um, they're not quite as, uh, what can I say? They're not as traditional in my view, not quite as delicious as fried, but they're good. And they're a lot less, they use a lot less oil. Um, for dairy, you can do things like marinating feta, which is uh, a quick and easy way to get dairy uh, that doesn't require any cooking. Um, okay, the craziest Hanukkah food that I found online was edible, was make, it, make your own gelt with, get this, edible gold dust. <laughs> and then of course I had to go online to, to Amazon to see how much does edible gold dust cost? Well, it's really not that expensive, but uh, I'm not going there. Um, and Israeli restaurants apparently when they're in their Sufganyot uh, state, uh, for Hanukkah, they sometimes do deep fried croissant, which we know in this country as cronuts. Well, they have their own versions of them. So uh, I thought that sounded kind of good. Um, so I wanna just show you the recipes that I, um, that I chose. Uh, there are five of them. I think you've seen that. Have they been sent out already, Laura? They have been, and I posted the link in the chat. Great. Okay, so I chose the two Ashkenazic standbys, which are latkes and blintzes. Uh, latkes being a lot easier to make than blintzes because blintzes have a kind of two stage, but be that as it may. I have the traditional uh, boikos, the Sephardic uh, cheese, cheese uh, biscuit, I guess you'd say. Um, there's an unusual for most of us Hanukkah dish, which is uh, it's rice. And I would like to show it to you, but I'm not sure you can see it. It's rice with raisins made in a style that's kind of like, a, it's made in almost a risotto. And you use either broth or water. Uh, we'll talk about that in just a second. And then there are two uh, what I describe as twists on uh, the use of olive oil, which are olive oil cookies, and then a cake, an orange upside down cake made in a cast iron pan. So um, I can talk about those, but I'd like to hear from you. Tell me a little bit about what you're making for Hanukkah. Anybody? Laura, maybe are you in charge of... Uh, Unmuting people? Um, I think people can unmute themselves, but I'm happy to do that. Let me put my gallery view on so I can see. If anyone would like to chime in, please just unmute or wave your hand or put up your electronic hand. Hi, Laura. <laughs> Hi, Laura. Hi, Laura. Laura the first. We have no <laughs> Laura. Laura. More Laura. Laura. I'm a Laura too. Oh, great. Uh, yeah. What are you making? Um, I'm, I make something that's nobody's tradition that I'm aware of, except mine, corn fritters. What a lovely idea. Yeah, I mean, they're fried, it's Hanukkah, and uh, it's, it's, it's different. <laughs> so and how do you, you make them? Do you use whole corn or do you- I use a up? can of corn, I mean, hey, you know, uh, a can of corn, some flour, and uh, I guess an egg, I've forgotten. I have to look up the recipe every year, but I make it once a year at Hanukkah and uh, usually serve it with some maple syrup. And uh, it, it's, as I said, nobody's tradition other than my own, but I enjoy it. And I'm a fa my family does too, I sincerely hope. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I will tell Laura, you a tip on corn is that Trader Joe's canned corn is very delicious mm. and is really quite close, oh, really close to, to Corn what on the I cob? would do, corn on the cob, if I were mm. to cook it very, you know, just just to be with the Italians would say with pasta al dente. Al dente, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's a, well. Thank you for the tip. We're actually moving in a few days to a place closer to Trader Joe's. So there you go. <laughs> well, there you go. Well, yeah. 
I have several several cans of Trader Joe's corn in my in my pantry. Maybe I'll try your corn fritters. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I do something similar, Laura. Oh, really? So I, yeah, I've decided to do pancakes. So the past couple oh. of years, kind of a similar vein. They're actually, you know, cooking at the moment. That's why I keep turning off my camera. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but but I, I'm with you on the uh, corn fritters. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Do what do you include? Do you have any onion or no, oh, no spices they're, or no? They're pretty. Uh, the dough itself is pretty bland. But uh, you know, deep fry it and stick maple and stick maple syrup on it. Hey, you can't go wrong. I mean, <laughs> yeah, but uh, you're sweet or savory. Sweet. As I it's said, my you know, what about yours, Deb? Mine, I make my mom's buttermilk pancakes, but I've actually made it tonight with dueling kugels. We have my family's kugel, which is ridiculously fattening, um, cream cheese, apricot nectar, all that <laughs> kind of stuff, similar to Laura's, Laura Nade. And Adam's family makes a more healthy one with applesauce and cinnamon and raisins. So dueling kugels at the Cohen house. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will put in a plug for Maura Laura's uh, kugel, which was prize winning at the um, Dishing Me Diaspora Kugel contest. <laughs> but here's the funny thing. I have the same recipe. So there's some sort of funny Jewish geography going on because my mom got it from a woman in Ohio, I believe, from a rabbi's wife. And Laura's dad was a rabbi in Ohio. So wow. there's something because okay. I have the same recipe. Yeah, <laughs> we have to track that down, Deb. It's, it's fascinating. I know. Mm -hmm. And anybody else cooking anything fun? I, I am not making it this year because I don't have both kids at home with me and I don't want to eat the whole thing. But I always made a dreidel shaped cake. Mm. So, and, and anything of ethnic origin, it came out of a box mix. But you know, you would cut the cake to shape like a dreidel and then you'd have enough with the ends to make the little spinner top. Mm. Put gelt all over the top of it. Mm. Uh, kind of a visual and it was mm. chocolate for some reason. I think the chocolate frosting set off the, uh, the gold gelt very well. <laughs> Well, I will admit that I was once invited into a Christmas cookie blogging thing. And of course, I wanted to make sure that everybody knew that there were other cookies besides Christmas cookies. So I invented a Hanukkah cookie, which was basically the, the same kind of cookie as, um, you know, the peanut butter blossoms that every, a lot of people do as Christmas cookies. But I took a piece of Hanukkah gelt and I would unwrap it and put it on the top of the cookie. Mm -hmm. And the only thing I learned from that that was unexpected, shall we say, was that it's a lot harder to unwrap Hanukkah gelt than it is to unwrap a Hershey's Kiss. This so I had to sit there mm -hmm. and unwrap like, you know, 36 pieces of Hanukkah gelt. I was going <laughs> crazy. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anybody else doing fun Hanukkah? Cooking, baking. Hmm. Hmm. Who else is out there? Well, we've been inspired uh, by seeing all these, uh, your talk and the recipes and things to try a bunch of different kinds of latkes this year. Oh, so what are you we're, making? We're gonna try. We're, we're not sure mm. yet, but we usually just do like the easiest we can find, which is e either buying them <laughs> yeah. or, um, like just sticking everything in the blender and making it like a puree and making it into pancakes, but we might try something more elaborate. This so year. do you have a Cuisinart with a, um, a grating blade? No. <laughs> do you have a box grater? Yeah, we have a grater thing. Okay. So if you take a box grater and you use my recipe, which is the three cups of grated potatoes, substitute for one or two of the cups any other vegetable, carrots, you know, uh, beets, uh, zucchini, anything. And the only thing is to be really careful with your hands. So you don't get an incredible, I, I mean, because uh, believe me, I've used more Band-Aids than a, with using a box greater than most people have used in their lives. Um, but it's, it's so easy once you get that started. And the only thing to know is just like with the potatoes, when you do anything that's wet, like a zucchini, you want to press the water out of it. 
because otherwise you just end up with mush pancakes. Sog. Yeah. But you know, just press the water out of zucchini, carrots. There's nothing to press out, <laughs> um, and you'll be you'll have delicious pancakes. Mm. Maybe you know you could even do here's okay starch upon starch. You could do corn and something else. Mm -hmm. So mm. anyway. <laughs> Rosella, I hope you have a good time with your kids. <laughs> Thank you. I see. Hi. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My former diaspora. Hi. <laughs> so this is Eva and Jordan. Oh, hi. Hi. I don't know if you can hear me. I see that I'm looking very witch-like, but in any event. Uh, um, so we're making uh, latkes in a sheet pan style. So we saving ourselves the frying of individual latkes, but they will essentially be fried because you put it in a sizzling with oil sheet pan. So we'll see how that goes. Mm. And for protein, um, I'm making a frittata, but I didn't want to use a dozen eggs. So I'm cutting it with tofu. And uh, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, sounds yeah. good. I mean, the, the, actually the latkes, that's interesting because it's sort of a cross between baked and fried. Right, right. It, mm -hmm. it should come out very fried looking because it's, it was a sizzling hot pan, but you're right. It, it, the top will probably be more baked and, and um, less crispy. Mm -hmm. But if you flip them over, I mean, hey, you know, and the trick is, I guess, just get the pan really super hot. Yeah. Yeah, no, flipping that over, you know, like a nine by 13 sheet pan would, would be a trick. <laughs> it would be a miracle. <laughs> <I'm not> a <laughs> miracle. <laughs> so we'll see. Paula. Hi, everybody. Happy Hanukkah. Hi. I wanted to share that we learned our Hanukkah potato laki um, cooking method from the Italian preschool from when we were there, um, when our kids were in preschool and we would come to like the class celebration and the teachers were making the potato lakis in electric skillets and you could make like 10 at once. And I was amazed and delighted and like immediately ran out and bought an electric skillet and so now that that's how we do it. So you can make a lot more at once. And we set up a table outside of our kitchen and the side door and we do it outside. So we don't have that potato locky smell for the week all in our house. So thank oh, you for preschool. Shout out to the preschool. You are a woman after my own heart because <laughs> that's how I did my latkes in an electric fry pan on the porch. Yeah. And I was looking, I have, I think two fry pans two electric fry pans, but I could only find one. So I could only do, I, I managed, basically, I'm trying to remember, I think my, I could only get in six at one time, not 10. You must have yeah. a huge. It's like a, it's one of those great electric skillets. It's, um, it's rectangular shaped and it's deep. So you can put a lot of oil in there and just go to town with your potato laki. It's, it's awesome. But I have to admit, I went back out on, the, uh, we have a screen in porch and I went out there again at like one in the morning and I could still smell the lacus. <laughs> the, oh, yeah. the good news was I could also close the door and it, it didn't smell in the kitchen. Yeah, outside is the way to go. So Paula is putting her address in the chat and after this call, everyone is stopping by her porch <laughs> and getting your latkes. Oh, we're not making them yet. Everyone who came. <laughs> we're doing it another night, but we will definitely be doing it. <laughs> <laughs> So I want to give you also a little hint about these guys, which is that you have the recipe for them. And they're, it's actually very delicious. And I'm going to break one and try and show you. They're very flaky on the inside. But if you follow the recipe, which was the adaptation of something I found online, this is how thin they are. Next time, I'm going to try them thicker. And instead of putting on... Um, sesame seeds, which is traditional and makes them very, um, what can I say? They're, they're uh, delicious, but the, the flavor is very uh, delicate. I'm gonna probably go for like grated Parmesan. <laughs> 
something because I know there, there's like a ton of cheese in here, but I don't really, really don't taste it that much. Um, but anyway, they were quite good. And, it, and the dough was really easy to work with. And it's great for making with kids because the dough is really very simple. And you, you pop them with a biscuit cutter or a candy uh, cookie cutter. And so it's a lot of fun for kids to do. I didn't have any kids around, but I was having a lot of fun. Anyone else doing fun cooking? Who else is making some special Hanukkah dish tonight? Laura, can you see anyone? Um, I don't see anyone, but I, I have a question for you, Laura. Sure. So we traditionally associate olive oil with Hanukkah, but I know that's not the best oil for frying. What kind of oil do you recommend for frying? Hopefully I didn't miss you saying that earlier. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I, I was should have given that as one of the tips, which is that typically you use a flavorless oil. And I use canola because it's cheap. Some people say they can actually detect a slight aroma in canola oil, in which case you should use something like safflower or sunflower oil, something that really has absolutely no um, smell or taste because you really just want to taste the potatoes and the onion. I mean, that's really what it's about, right? So, and one of the things I, I would just remark, this uh, rice recipe calls for using either broth or um, broth or water. And I ended up using about half and half um, because I started to use broth and then I found it was getting a very, um, deep color and really a very, um, the broth was really flavoring it much more than I expected. So I ended up sort of diluting the broth with some hot water. And it, it's really very simple to make. If you go to the store and you see various grained recipes of grained rice, there's long grain, medium grain, and there's short grain rice, which is the kind that's used for risotto. And that's what this is made out of. So the only reason I have such a little container of it is my husband ate all of it last night. So I, I've never put rice in, I've never put raisins in rice before, but it was good. Others, sorry. The Hanukkah olive oil cookies, by the way, they come out a little bit crumbly. If you decide that you're gonna make them and you want them to have a little bit more um, uh, body and not be so crumbly, you can add a little bit more oil and maybe slick the outside with a little bit of water. Um, but they're a good slice and bake cookie. And uh, for those of you who are into nuts and chocolate, uh, that's what they mostly are. <laughs> Held together with a little oil. I'm surprised when you said that you don't, you've never made rice with raisins before. I, I have some great salad recipes for rice salads with raisins and nuts and all kinds of good stuff. Oh, so, I've used it in cold rice, but I've, oh, okay. I've never made like a heated rice recipe. Oh, I have a, a one that I really enjoy. It's got sliced apples and, and rice and nice. allspice and uh, nice. stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, that's one of our favorites. Well, <laughs> and um, if you look at the olive oil cake, one of the things that, that's kind of interesting about that particular recipe is that it's an upside down cake. It's kind of like a you know pineapple upside down cake, only this one is oranges and it uses olive oil instead of butter. Um, and it can also be made on a grill. You can do it in the oven, which, um, the blog post that it comes from does it both ways. Um, and you can do it in the oven, that works just fine. But if you're into outside cooking, if you're heating up your electric fry pan and you might as well heat up your griddle and do a cake. Others? Do you see any traditional drinks? Oh, Alexis first, and then I'm curious about drinks. Yeah, I just, can you just turn that off just for us? I just wanted to say, um, we're gonna be doing some outdoor cooking with the preschool. So maybe we'll try the, uh, the olive oil cake. Um, we're actually gonna make our latkes outside next week. 
um, and Paula will appreciate this on the griddles. <laughs> we're going to run an electric cord, but um, yeah, we we're outside for the preschool. So it might be kind of fun to try some of these other traditional things. Um, you know, it's part of outdoor cooking. It should work just fine. And I mean, I've always cooked my, since I've learned about uh, cooking latkes outside, you know, on the porch or I don't cook them actually outside, outside. I mean, it's a screened in porch, but um, yeah, wow. And, uh, but little kids near hot oil, that's you, you must be doing a great job to. Yeah, so we usually, when we do it inside, we have like little traffic cones we put up around it. So there's an area where we can, where we can cook outside, but we don't have to necessarily, they won't, they can see it, but they won't be up close to it. Uh huh. Social distancing with the oil, basically. <laughs> well, that's fantastic. And in fact, one of the one of the nice things about latkes is, and it, Joan Nathan's recipe suggests that you put that you form the latkes ahead of time when they're cold, and you refrigerate them for a while. So you know, I, I'm sort of curious to try hers and maybe add some onion, because I like the idea of trying, um, you know, this baking them for baking a potato for 30 minutes which is about half the time you would normally do then grating it and then turning it into a latke shape but oh i gotta have some onion in there but uh after you do that then you fry them and of course she's frying in them at the last minute so uh i i haven't done that in a while i've i've been firmly of the fry it freeze it and then put it in the oven school So Laura, you mentioned the tradition of the wine. Yeah. And I'm sorry, I interrupted another Laura. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say that my mother used to make something that was so good. And my brother and I, for some reason, cannot replicate it, which was mashed potato pancakes. She would make you know, mashed potatoes and she would add an egg, I guess, and some flour. I mean, stupid us, we didn't watch. And then she would you know, form them into pancake shapes, not thin, but you know, a little, little hefty and she would then fry them in oil and they were incredibly delicious and it wasn't just for Hanukkah I mean she'd make them you know all year long but they were really good if anybody knows how to do that and make it work I'd love to know how what was the problem when you tried that tried it they fell apart ah so uh, it's really just figuring out the proportion and do you know what kinds of potatoes she used no, as I said, if wait, probably Idaho. I I don't remember remember anything much more growing up than you know Idaho potatoes, and uh, um, uh, that that would be my guess. Uh, well, Russet or Idaho are the ones that are typically used used for latkes because right. they have the most starch in them, and they're really right. 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 together. Together. Yeah. No, my mother's had a beautiful shape, and mine just kind of crumbled apart. So it might have been a bad, a bad combination of oil and and I mean egg and um, and flour. Maybe I just didn't get the proportions correct. But and oh, then yeah. sometimes when she was really really into it, she would stuff them with chopped liver. Ooh. So chopped liver in the middle, and uh, that was a big treat for my brother. A culinary. <laughs> Delight. Oh, no question about it. No question about it. But he survived it. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Coronary delight is a good description. <laughs> of the type of potato, I read a couple of articles that said Red Bliss were the starchiest and the best for latkes. Well, I used to use Red Bliss and then I moved over to Russets and I don't know, russets seem to work for me, but I have hmm. used Red Bliss and they were fine, you know? Yeah. I don't know. I use Econ Gold and they're really good. Do I really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So once again, that there are doesn't matter. ways to do it right. Doesn't matter at all. The other, the, another article I read suggested that you use two different um, blades so that you have different lengths of uh, potato gratings. I don't know oh, why that is. Interesting thought. Yeah. Hold on one second. Oh. 
I actually think that would be good. When I worked at a restaurant, um, we did that with the apples for the apple pies. Um, uh -huh. So it does, it just gives you a different texture. So yeah. Yeah. Huh. Well, it's, it's interesting that the one thing I've, I've really found about latkes is that the ones that come from a store that are pre-made, like the, the ones you can buy frozen, typically don't have the kind of um, the grated edges, you know, the ones that are really the crispy edges. They tend to make them in a more uh, uniform way. And that to me is just, it doesn't cut it <laughs> latke-wise. So, um, you know, I don't know about using, I'll have to try two blades, but or two different methods of uh, cutting the potatoes. But that sounds kind of time consuming. At the very least, you gotta make sure you have the good sharp edges on a latke to get it. When it fries, it's gotta get those, you know, blackened little pieces, darkened little pieces. What, don't tell my family that it's supposed to look like that because I eat the edges before. <laughs> so, <laughs> so please keep that a secret. <laughs> wow. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. Laura, what was the, um, the name of the Tunisian dish that you said with the egg and the phyllo dough? Oh, those were really good. Hold on one second, I'll get that. I, oh, it's, they're called Brick, B-R-I-K. Okay. And if you want, um, I can actually send you the link. Um, you're talking about the ones that were phyllo with a sort of an omelet in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. It's from something called theculturetrip.com. Okay, great. I yeah. just, we have friends who were from um, Tunisia and I went to ask her about it. Thank you. Yeah. Well, um, I just finished watching uh, an episode of the Great British Breaking Show. I have to admit, I've watched it all the way through and now I've gone back and I'm watching it for a second time. But there was one episode where they made their own phyllo dough. And I have to say that I have, that is one thing that is not on my bucket list. No, no. yeah. I'm just gonna buy it, buy it, buy it. I know there's some things that it, they just should be bought. <laughs> phyllo <laughs> dough is not enough. <laughs> Oh, and this is, this is another Trader Joe's tip. And I am not paid by Trader Joe's. I've never made a dime from these tips, but they have the absolute best um, pastry, which is in their um, frozen food cabinet. And they only sell it between Thanksgiving and New Year's. So if you go now to Trader Joe's, you know, over the next month or so, um, it is... Um, I don't know where it depends on the Trader Joe's as to where it is, but it's it's you know pastry that's rolled. Um, why why is the name of that pastry? It's, it's puff good. pastry, and I agree they have the right. best puff pastry. Yeah, and they do. It's, it's in the so freezer section. Cheaper than do four, but it's all butter. Yep. And Pepperidge Farm, which is kosher, which is parv, is made with oil, and it's uh, I don't know. Not yeah. Oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> a real pastry chef has now put her in for a model. No, but I agree. You're, you're completely right, 100%. <laughs> so, and Maura, Laura, I don't know what beverages are traditional for Hanukkah, other than in my house, red wine. <laughs> I was just thinking about it because Michael Solomonov did a Hanukkah cooking demonstration, I think it was last week for Jewish federations across America. And he made an apple shrub, but I think it was because, you know, apples are seasonal now and it's very refreshing. It kind of cuts through because it's a little bit of a sparkle to it. Yeah, yeah. It cuts through some of the oil. Ooh, right. that sounds delicious. I mean, I don't know if it's traditional, but I'd go for that. Shrubs are, are of course a, a big Ashkenazi, you know, thing and they're very popular now, so. Um, yeah, wow. I think anything with potato vodka is a good match for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go for that. Anyone else? What's so as we wrap? Oh, Deb, go ahead. I just had a question because I'm 
curious if you've come across this name, Laura, Laura um, Kuman. Sorry, <laughs> there's a lot of Lauras. Um, Laura. So my parents made blintzes growing up. Like I, yeah. Nana's recipe, like whole shebang. They always called the crepey pancakey part a bledel. Have you heard that word? Did we make it up? Is it Yiddish? I don't. My mother always referred to bledlach. Really? Okay. Bledlach. Yeah. I'll make the bledlach. And uh, yeah. Oh, and, how and we use farmer's cheese. I don't know what kind of cheese. We do so too. Yeah. Use yeah, ricotta, yeah. But no. We use farmer. No offense to any ricotta users. Yeah. Well, Nana didn't use ricotta. Find farmer's cheese now. So I. Wegmans. Ricotta. Sorry. Wegmans has it. Oh, really? Okay. Well, I've been using ricotta. If you drain it, it's okay. Ah. But yeah. Oh, Wegmans. Ah. Wegmans. Yeah. 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 And it's over by the that. cheese. What will? Russian, any Russian store will also have it. It's called Tvarog in Russian and it's very popular there. Except so. it's written in Russian and we won't be able to read that it says that. <laughs> and, and apparently people are yes. using, people who uh, have school age kids who are getting the school lunches are taking the uh, milk because the, they get a ton of milk that the kids aren't drinking and they turn that into farmer's cheese. So oh, you can my goodness. take it yourself apparently. Whoa. New project. Oh. Winter break. You got time. Yep. Well, yeah. I have a, actually a recipe on my blog for making homemade ricotta, which is probably the same as making homemade farmer's cheese. And it's really simple. You're right. But I mean, you basically just let it sit in cheesecloth for a very long time. <laughs> but, it's so much fun to hear about everyone's traditions and some are similar and some are just, you know, a little tick different for our families. Um, and Laura Jacobs, I mean, your family associates corn fritters with Hanukkah. Like they always will, your kids, yeah. your grandkids. It's just lovely how traditions develop. So before we end, let's do one activity together because there was always a huge debate about what to put on top of latkes and Laura Kuman mentioned a few things. Uh, I'm gonna ask you to type into the chat if you're close to your computer, your favorite topping, but do not hit enter. We're all gonna do it at the same time. <laughs> so, nobody's gonna influence anyone else. So go ahead and type in your favorite topping. We'll wait just another couple seconds. All right, three, two, one, hit enter. Okay, Rose said, I like the outlier, mm. <laughs> delicious. I just would never have any. It, it's a belief that I have that anything is better with Rose. Chocolate <laughs> is not true because barbecue with chocolate is not great. But Haroset actually goes with everything. So in that sense, Haroset beats chocolate. <laughs> wow. Yeah, but how do you make it? There is, I mean, there are billions of Haroset recipes. So that's exactly the problem because <laughs> my grandma uh, makes it every year and she used to make the same amount that she would make for the Seder. She would make just for me for the rest of the week. Um, <laughs> And then when I moved here, I asked her, what's the recipe? And she was like, there is no recipe. And I was like, but it's every year the same. It's like, yeah, but I just taste it. And I was like, but how much do you put up everything? Like, I don't know. So I, I tried to get something out of her last year and write it down. Um, it came out pretty close, but <laughs> not exactly the same. That's because it missed grandma's love. Of course, that's always, always the issue. It, she was with me as I was making it. We were, were talking, but it still wasn't her doing it. But it has to be the Ashkenazic one without nuts, without dates, without all of that. It's just a simple with um, apple wine and, and all that. Hmm. Well, hmm. I mean, that when you say Haroset, I've actually started to make something which is uh, called emergency salad in the suffrage cookbooks, but I'm calling it savory haroset 
-hmm. because apples and onions, it turns out a little bit of lime. (gasps) Interesting. And it wouldn't, I'm going to think about now that you've, you've turned me, you've, you've just rocked my world because I'm going to try it on latkes tonight. Wow. Huh. A little sour cream. Yum. (laughs) And Deb, I still love you, even though. I, I just don't understand how you could not like love this. But... <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. I, I've. But wait, what? But you eat blintzes, right? Oh, yeah. Blintzes are awesome. Lakas, the. Okay. As a, I mean, you know. I, I don't even like chicken soup and matzo balls either. So I don't know. My, I've, I've had people question my religion, you know, <laughs> based on my food. Like. No, you like, you <laughs> like blintzes. So you're in there. Maybe you should start going to a Sephardic shul. Uh, hmm. They don't like latkes in Sephardic shuls? Well, they don't have them. True. I mean, they have they have potato pancakes, but they make them differently. And who knows? You might like those. Maybe I'd like that. I don't know. We're, we're, we're not letting you go. It was just a joke. You know that. <laughs> okay, fine. I'll stay. No, you're not going. <laughs> I'm going to thank the the Roismans and the Kimmelheims for their decorations. Um, those look great on my screen, and I'm a little worried that maybe Hannah and I are in the same room, <laughs> looking at the color and the white. Um, but thank you so. Oh, that's lovely. We have a whole table. I used to do that when my kids were home. And oh. you have to look this the sweater as well. The sweater is even better. The sweater. My kids are at home. Though. Oh my God, oh my look God. at that sweater. Yay! <laughs> Very fun. I pull it out for eight days of the year. That is hysterical. That is fabulous. I think next year for Passover Seder, you need to show up with that sweater as well. And okay. people are going to ask, why is that night different than all the other nights? And there you go. That sounds like a good plan. Maybe I will do that, yes. And I want to thank Rosella for organizing tonight. Yay, thank you, Rosella. Thank you, Rosella. And it's always a pleasure to have you here with us, Laura. So you've taught us about Purim now and you've taught us about Hanukkah. So we're going to start hitting you with, you know, some more obscure holidays, maybe. Shmini <laughs> There you go. <laughs> I don't recommend some Gedalia. That's a fast no. thing. <laughs> Log for Omar. Ne- Perfect. Next Yom Kippur, I'm inviting Laura to teach right before Mincha about Yom Kippur food. <laughs> we will not make it. We were so hungry through this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I, will I made a terrible mistake on Yom Kippur. I was Zooming, and who wasn't? But I, right next to me were pictures of my daughter's wedding including the buffet table oh. <laughs> and everything was, I mean, they grew all their, they grew everything that was served at the wedding that was a vegetable or a fruit. So it was uh, very fresh and very good. And I'm sitting there looking at it while we're zooming. Very stupid of me, but. I can only tell you that Yom Kippur is always a net caloric gain for me. <laughs> at the end of the day. At the end of the day. Uh-huh. Yeah, lots of carbs, yep. So, and I want to thank whoever that are. Ah, it's the Roismans. Gosh, between the Roismans and the and Rosella, we've got decorations like wow. This is puts me to shame with my little you know white walls. Well, if you went to my son's house, as you open the front door, you see a fireplace, which is the weirdest place for a fireplace. But that's all of the story. And the the request that he made one year from me for Hanukkah, everybody in the family has a stocking, and and they're Hanukkah stockings. I mean, I, <laughs> knit, I knit them. I, I I should say I knit them. So each person has his own Hanukkah stocking in appropriate colors and so forth, hanging from the fireplace. Oh, fantastic! So. Yeah. This is a wonderful way to start Hanukkah. Um, And it's lovely to celebrate with all of you. Anyone else have any last thoughts about food or Hanukkah or latke toppings? I just want to remind everyone that we're just starting. 
It feels like we're already full of latke. We haven't even started yet. Mm. So keep it up. We have a lot of things coming up. Um, we have, of course, Shabbat tomorrow and, and Saturday. We have a Havdalah Saturday night, Saturday night. where Will is we'll we'll playing some music with us as well on Saturday night. And then Monday, a big family fun game with trivia and everything else. And we're going to end with some Ultimate Dreidel Championship on <laughs> Thursday night. <laughs> so please look it up on our daily emails during Hanukkah and everything. All the information is there.